All right. Welcome back to Waste Some Time with Jason Green. I am Jason Green, bringing you brand new interviews every Monday and every Friday right here on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe to find out when we have more interviews, even though I just told you it's Monday and Friday. You got to keep up on that. helps the channel. Also, if you think you can ask better questions of the guests or you want to see these interviews before anybody else, make sure you go to the Patreon link in the description. Pick the appropriate tier, and you will be asking the questions of the guests like the legend we have today. The word legend gets thrown around uh, maybe too easily. In this case, it couldn't be more accurate. I am honored that we have Susie Quattro joining us all the way from the United Kingdom. This I don't get up early for, for, for anybody but uh, Susie Quattro. If you were in America and you were around my age, maybe you discovered her from watching Happy Days. Maybe you knew Leather Tuscadero. Unfortunately, if you saw it in reruns, by the time you discovered Leather Tuscadero, Susie probably wasn't playing in America anymore. But she's been busy, and we have a lot to talk about, including her book, her movie, and a brand new record of music. We are going to talk about all of that and more right after this. All right, please welcome Susie Quattro. How you doing? <laughs> Hi, Susie. I'm really glad you're here. And, you know, one of the first things I wanted to say is that, so I, I've been a fan of yours for quite some time. And I remember always telling people, especially female musicians, you have to check out Susie Quattro. You are missing out. And for a little while, not everybody knew. But then this YouTube generation came around. Yeah, yeah. And while music may be uh, harder for artists to make money, it sure is easy for people to get. And now I talk to younger people who worship Susie Quattro, you know, and, and are very familiar with the path that you paved for so many musicians that were not people doing what you did. I'm telling you this, you know it, but I want to make sure the audience knows there are people who tune in for the first time and are new. And I want them to understand that there is no runaways. There is no Joan Jett, all of these things that would have later happened. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, um, and the, and, the, and the movie, if there's anything that we miss in this interview, I want to make sure Susie Q, it's streaming everywhere. Anything we miss is in this movie. It is really worth your time to watch um, and to, to hear about this career that some people missed out on. When I said we were having you on, people were excited of all ages. They really wanted to know more about your story. And so I, I'm, I'm honored, like I said, that you're going to let us dive into that. Well... You know, I, I always, I mean, the, the documentary was, you know, mind blowing for me, but what I take to my grave is that I was the first. That's that's stamped on me. And that's the only thing that I kind of really start off anything with. When people say, oh, maybe you were an inspiration. No, no, I was the first. And that's what I always make sure they get clear. Um, sure, I wasn't the first girl musician, no, but I was the first rock and roll girl musician to have worldwide success and and leader male band that it just hadn't happened before so that kind of belongs to me and if you like you say you watch suzy q the documentary and every girl in there just says oh well we basically we wouldn't have done it had we not seen her because they didn't know you could do it but i i have to finish this pattern now that you started that um i didn't know that I was doing that. I was simply stubbornly, as I still am today at 71, sticking to who I am. I won't change, I won't alter, I won't compromise, I'm me. So I didn't know that I was making this great big statement. All I was doing was being who I was. I couldn't be her, I couldn't be her, I couldn't be her, I couldn't be him, couldn't be, I could only be me. And that, that was how I won, by sticking to that, no matter what. Yeah, and it, and it shows. And it also shows that gender wasn't necessarily a thing to you because when you were young, you saw Elvis on the Ed Sullivan show and you weren't, and maybe uh, you were probably only five years old, but so maybe your sisters and some of the girls were kind of swooning over Elvis, which is understandable. But at your age, it was more like, uh, wow, look at this. I want to do this. Yeah, that was, it's the strangest. And even when I tell the story, it's it's surreal to me, but 
um, as you get to talk to me, I'm a real no bullshitter person. I'm straight down the line. Uh, I don't know how to lie. My face shows it. You see my nose growing. You see, I can't lie. Anyway, that actually happened to me. I was five and a half and we were all watching the Ed Sullivan show. Like every American family did. It was Sunday night entertainment, something for everybody in the family. Five and a half. I was elder sister by nine years. On comes Elvis. She starts to scream. And I remember looking at her and thinking, what's the matter with you? Because I was five and a half. Why are you screaming? And then I went into the I went into the camera. I remember it. Pulled me in. And I thought to myself, which is the strange part, I'm going to do that. Don't ask me how I knew. Because I haven't got the answer to that. All I can tell you is that moment in my life. And that stayed with me my whole life. Yeah, and a few years down the road, Beatles are going to be on Ed Sullivan. Another, uh, you know, massive. I, I've got to do this, and uh, and then you, you're you know you're from a musical family, so everyone in the family play music. It's 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 fascinating. You have four uh, siblings, quattro, and uh, three females who all uh, sisters who all performed as well. And like many people who play the bass. It's almost you either draw the shortest straw or no one else wanted to play it. I play the bass. I love it. But I think it's one of those things that you uh, you end up with. And in your case, you end up with a 57 Fender P bass. You couldn't be, couldn't be a cooler bass to start. Uh, the bass is almost bigger than you uh, at that point. You're, you're, you know, you're only maybe five feet tall, right? I'm five foot two. Don't okay. make me sure. I've never, I've actually reached my full height at the age of 12 and I'm now 71. I'm still five foot two, <laughs> mm -hmm. but it was a case of seeing the, seeing the Beatles. And, um, again, on the S Sullivan show and we all, all, we got on the phone with two other sisters and another girl whose dad played my dad's band. We all in the area and, um, Patty said, let's start an our band. And everybody went, yeah, 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 yeah. I already played properly reading and writing and playing percussion and piano that was my instruments i was trained on i mean i'm a classical pianist and um everybody took an instrument and i actually didn't speak up quick enough and patty said to me you're playing bass i went okay i, I didn't mind and when my dad gave me my 57 fender precision another light bulb moment i i put that on and i just went you know how you do that you just kind of go yeah it was my instrument. But, you know, when you play percussion and piano, those piano is a percussive instrument. So really, that's where my area is. I'm very percussive minded. Yeah. And and, and it shows you um, You also didn't play with a pick. You know, uh, it's you, you 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 took the old fashioned hard route to do it and uh, and went on to have a style of your own that I know people have emulated for years. Tina Weymouth from um, Talking Heads, Kathy Valentine from The go was really people who are, who are trendsetters in what they do as well, but a lot got to see you doing it first. I want you to tell me a little bit about what James Jamerson meant to you. I know that almost everyone should know who James Jamerson is, but if they don't, this is probably one of the greatest bass players of all time, and at least the most recorded. There, there, there could not be somebody that you know more songs by every Motown song. So tell me what his influence was like on you. Oh boy, um, born and raised in Detroit, so very much weaned on white rock and roll, but also weaned on Motown, all of us, all of us were. Um, wow. I used to dance on a TV show in 1966. I was already in my band. I was part of the regular audience like they used to have an America bandstand. And uh, I used to get to see The Temptations, The Four Tops, uh, Supremes, the Miracles, they were here, like as close as this computer to me, on the stage, and I would watch them, and they went into my psyche. And bass-wise, what changed my life, I didn't know Jameson, he's the bass player of all those wonderful 60s mm -hmm. Motown hits. And for me, I'm sorry, but I think the 60s were Motown's golden years. Sorry. That's how I feel. That's how I feel. And... Um, he played all that great stuff, and I was hanging around Motown. I was about 16, and I went. In, I got into the studio, and 
the Funk Brothers were up in the control room. They were taking a break. And me being me, you know, I know no fear. I went down into the pit and I grabbed Jameson's space and I started to play to show off. Show Amazing. Off. And the button went down and he said, hey, you're not bad for a white chick. And I went, I said, oh, thank you. He said, but you know what? It's not what you play. It's what you don't play that counts. I went, ah, okay. And from that moment on, actually, I have to say, I started to study more what he did and I, without getting too anal about it, um, how sweet it is, Marvin Gaye, how sweet it is to be loved by you. Da -doom 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 -doom. It's walking bass, right? Um, a little trick, and you can try it on yourself. Play 10 seconds of that song, maybe 20 seconds. Take it off and sing the bass part you thought you heard. Try it out, try it out. I guarantee you, put the record back on and it's a quarter of the notes you thought you heard. And that taught me my, I was between boogie and jazz. That was my style, very boogie, very jazz. And Jameson put it all together for me. And I do leave spaces. And uh -huh. people, people always ask me, they ask me all the time, how do you sing lead? and play bass. Well, I've done it since 1964. I'm 58 years of professional now. And I think what saved me in that particular instance is I didn't learn bass and then become lead singer. I was given the bass to learn and at the same time became lead singer. So the two of them just went like this for me. I didn't realize it was supposed to be difficult. I didn't realize there might be a lighter bass. I didn't realize there might be a shorter neck. I had no idea. When you give me something to do, I don't question it. I just go, okay, and I do it. Yeah, and there was no, uh, there was no path to follow yet. You, you were, you were, you were trend, uh, paving your own. I had no, I always say it, I had no blueprint. And all I knew for sure like I said, I didn't know I was doing what I was doing, but all I knew was that I wasn't like anybody else. And I couldn't quite figure out why that was. And it's a little bit unsettling, you know, when you're trying to make it and you, you know, you got it. And I, I knew I had it. I believed in myself and I'm thinking, oh my God, who am I? What am I? And all I could hang on to was that I wasn't like anybody else. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. And I think that was the key to my success. And no, I don't do gender. Fact of life. I never, ever ever thought of myself as a female musician. I am a musician. Yeah, absolutely. And that, and that does shows. Maybe there was an image and maybe there was some marketing, but, at, but you were who you were and your, your, the quality of your music went way above uh, gender. Um, so it starts with a band with your sisters called the Pleasure Seekers. And there's some videos and recordings of that and it, it's fun to watch. And later it becomes Cradle you kind of have, this is like 69, 71, I'm kind of guessing. And you uh, have the Johnny Bravo kind of story for those who know the Brady Bunch. Uh, the, the producers come in, they discover Greg, they don't want the band, they just want the one person. In your case, the legendary Mickey Most sees you and he doesn't want the band. He sees something in Susie Quattro. And this is going to be the beginning of a pretty amazing career. Yes. And... I have to backtrack a little bit because it's an important thing. I've discussed this with many other people like myself who have, who were picked out of a band. Mm -hmm. And I, I was always the lead person. All the lights were on me. So I did all the songs, da, 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 da. And uh, then when Cradle happened for about 18 months, I took a little bit of a backseat because um, my little sister was being brought in to be lead singer and she wanted to learn it. So I went back a bit. And this is strangely enough. This is the band that Electra Records saw and said no to the band immediately, only me. Mickey Most came over same week, exactly the same week, saw the band and said no to the band and only wanted me. So it was uh, my time to go. And I mm -hmm. kind of I kind of just accepted that. And that's it wasn't easy because you know, you're leaving your family and you're leaving your band and blah, blah, blah. But um, when, when opportunity knocks on the door, you got to be smart enough to let it in. Yeah, you don't always get uh, a second chance, and and as, as you knew and followed. Rarely. Yeah. I want to add a trivial note for people because we're talking about your sisters. You are also the aunt 
to Sherilyn Fenn, actress from Twin Peaks and tons of uh, other yeah. movies. Uh, yeah. yeah, and she's I don't just... think I don't think everyone knows that. No, oh my God. Okay, yeah. Um, that's my oldest sister's daughter. Yeah, she's my niece. Yeah, very proud of her. Such a beauty. Yeah. Such a such a she always was. Pretty little girl, pretty grown up, you know. Yeah, very proud of her. Entertainment uh runs in the, the quattro genes, uh, so to speak. It's it's in the family. There, there is there's a lot of talent in the family, I have to say. Um my brother's a fine pianist, always has been. Patty joined Fanny for a while. My little sister sings. My older sister was a keyboard. Yeah, it's just sort of a real a Brady Bunch, really. Mm -hmm. okay. A Partridge family, even. Yeah, it is. It, it is Partridge family. Um, we all played, all five of us kids. It wasn't unusual in my family to play four or five instruments each. Just It just, you know, nothing to brag about. We all did it. So it was a great, great training ground, great upbringing. And my father, I credit with giving me my entire attitude to the business. You know, he was... Uh, he was a, he worked for General Motors, but he was a musician all his life, but part time. He worked uh, after after he came home from work. He went out and did gigs, and uh, he gave me my professional attitude to what I do. Never left me. Yeah, and and that's which is a great thing to have. When uh, young people get to learn about Susie Quattro, they pick up their bass. They're learning these songs. They want to play that. It's so amazing that people can go on YouTube and and sort of learn a craft. When you think of what you had to go through to do it and have that natural ear which is not and feel because most people don't have that you've had some amazing people come in and out of your life the names that we're going to talk about are incredible mickey most brings you into the studio and who should be there but jeff beck and cozy powell cozy powell and the late drummer incredible you played with everybody um but what amazing people to be around and i still get the picture just knowing a little bit about watching your documentary and knowing about you you're not intimidated then either I'm, I'm not, not not intimidated, did you say? Yeah. I don't get intimidated by anything. Mm -hmm. Do you know, I just have always had a set of balls on me. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I don't know how else to put it. Um, I'm more sensitive than I am scared, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I think that does. And I think that shows a little bit because the tough exterior that people see of you there's also a very human side, and we will talk about some of that as well. But so, so that first meeting is is in Motown, you know, your home, Detroit. You go to the UK. UK is going to become your home. UK is going to be very good to you. You have a band of English musicians, and you start doing this. And I believe you start with singles because that is kind of how people were doing things still, right? Yeah. Um, my first. Let me see. I came in '71, and we recorded. Mickey was trying to find my style. I was trying to find my style. We both knew who I wasn't. Neither one of us quite knew who we was. I just know it wasn't gelling. Mickey never could record me properly. Um, then I, I said, I need a band because I've been in bands my whole life and I'm going crazy here. I need a band. So I got a band um, and the band did all my own songs, which got the style happening. Mm -hmm. And then we did, uh, I was the opening act on the first ever Slade tour in the right. UK. And that really got it really honed in you would go yeah. on first you would go on first for about 15 minutes then you'd get thin lizzie <laughs> and then slade what a bill <laughs> what do i want to start well naughty who's still a good friend of mine the lead singer from slade he said to me in fact he came on my big celebration this is your life and he told the story that nobody used to like the support groups of slade and they used to throw things at them, throw tin cans and all that uh, I had 15 minutes at the beginning and they loved me. So he, he said, he said, I always used to think she's got it. She's got it. <laughs> it's funny. Oh my I God. think that the natural, your natural appeal really was winning people over. And, and I, I, you know, I think that that because you were the only one and because it was authentic, I think people t took a minute and, and, and took this in and ha what a build to be on. And if you can win over an audience like that, you could yeah. probably win over anybody because that's a hardcore audience. Chin and Chapman come into your life. And I, I think everyone should know who they are. For those who don't, Chin and Chapman are the legendary songwriting team. They wrote, people might call some of those songs bubblegum songs. but Not if, really. No, they were never, they were just good writers. Yeah. End of, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and, you know, they, yes, absolutely. Uh, they, it, it's morning here. It's nighttime there. Uh, but the, the cheers for sure. Um, but they wrote uh, most of the sweet hit songs. They, they were and the early ones like Funny Funny and uh, um, Little Willie and these things, Wigwam Bam. These were all songs that were part of uh, Chin and Chapman. And yes. they look, they knew how to write a hit song. And I believe the first one with you was Can the Can. It was. And what happened was we came off. I mean, Mickey signed me as a singer, songwriter, musician. And it was in my contract. I write my own material. Mm -hmm. But we weren't getting anywhere. It was We weren't finding out what it was. And like I said, then that tour just kind of really made sense. Mickey recognized it. And he said, okay. He said, I've just signed these two new writers. They're very good. They know how to craft that magical three-minute single which is, it's a certain thing, you know? Um, and he said, do you mind if they come and see the set and maybe they can come up with a hit song based on what you're doing? And I thought, no, that that sounds good to me. So they came and saw the the, the, the show. And if you hear the first album, it's all very boogie and do, 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 that's what it is. And Mike, Mike went away that night and came back with Can the Can the next day. We went into the rehearsal room with the band and I mean, the demo was just him screaming on guitars, you know, so the band took a hold of it and it was very much, very much a team effort. The drummer put that wonderful Susie Quattro signature intro in there. My my ex-husband, Lenny, he had a certain way of playing. Nobody plays quite like him. Put that guitar bits in. I did my bass, which Mike pushed right up to the top. And uh, we had another drummer called Keith Hodge. He was on the first single. Then after that, Dave Neal joined. But it became... You know, when I recorded that, I could feel it in the studio that it was a hit. You can't. Yeah. It goes, goes up your neck, you know? It goes up your neck. And Mickey knew it, too. Mickey knew it, too. And when we played him the song, he said to me, okay, I think you have a number one. He was right. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, now it's serious, and now we need to discuss your image. So I said to him... Uh, Okay, you know, leather, it's it's leather because of Elvis, right the way through my life. I always kept it from, even from the comeback special. Elvis, leather, me, done, done, non-negotiable. And Mickey didn't like it, and he said it was old-fashioned. I remember him saying to me, it's been done. And I mm -hmm. said, not, not by me. And he said, okay, there it is. That's the iconic image. That's yeah, the we're iconic. Looking at the, we're looking at your book cover unzipped right here, but that is the image of that because you guys sort of compromised you wanted leather and he had and he thought of the jumpsuit right he did he did and um i can i can be sweetly naive a lot of the time and <laughs> i'm going to tell you the truth now um i just wanted to wear leather and mickey said i remember him going because mm -hmm, uh, okay 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 and then he went what about a jumpsuit and mm -hmm. i said i said in my naivety great idea because I thought I could jump around and everything would stay in one place. I had no idea <laughs> that it was, that it was sexy. Isn't that dumb? And it wasn't until I got the pictures back, the big, you know, what do you call those? The contact sheet. And, um, you're we sitting in Mickey's office and he had one of those little eye things and he was looking for the picture. Uh -huh. And he said, come here, have a look, see what you think. And I went, Oh, it's like, oh my God, is that me? So what you get on that iconic photo, and you, you have to admit this is true, it's not me trying to be sexy whatsoever. Well, no. I'm, I'm not trying to be anything. I think the reason that uh, boys growing up, including myself, found you so sexy was that you really had a very natural thing. Yes, the images were you know, can be sexy, but I think to see this this woman, young woman, who can play the bass and have this kick-ass attitude and be cool and lead the guys, I think leads to that. And while we're talking about leather, I could not not bring this up. The leather David bikini. <laughs> My leather bikini. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you took the leather to another uh, level. And, and this photo shoot is another iconic photo shoot that I'm sure yeah. boys growing up were, were losing their mind. Isn't it funny? And Whose you know, idea was this? It was, um, they just said, would you mind taking a picture in the leather bikini? I said, no. Um, 
because I just I don't even think about things like that. But it, it's it's the funniest thing when you talk about this whole thing here. I've had many many after festival in the bar with all the big acts, you know, when everybody we get talking, and it always comes around to this subject that we're talking about. Uh -huh. It just does. It just does. The guys always bring it around to this. Oh, yes. you and you, know, you and all the big guys, you know, these are famous people. And then I, as soon as they've had enough to drink, then I say, okay, let's go there. And then I've got their attention. And I said, uh, when you first saw me on TV, did it look like I was a girl going, I can be like you guys. And they always say no. I said, so what did it look like? You're just being natural. I said, right. And did I look like I was trying to be sexy? Every single one immediately, they say, no, what did it look like? Just that you were. I said, okay. Do you get the difference? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, uh, I guess that won for me because I actually did not try to be sexy. I still don't now. I mean, I don't even see myself that way. I just don't. I just don't. Yeah, but if, well, I, if, if I am, then hallelujah, you know, great. <laughs> well, I, I, listen, I'm, I'm saying it as, as tons of other people, not just men, women as well have always said that you know and at 71 years old you are still a beautiful woman i'm so Thank glad you. that uh that uh, that i'm able to spend this time with you but what one of the things i wanted to ask a little bit about was you know so you're a young woman around this time you're 22 23 you never really had the chance to have a normal childhood you're not a high school graduate I want to know a little bit about what, what what was it possible for you to date and meet people? I know that you will end up marrying the guitar player in your band. He performs on almost all of your records. And but before that, I know it was difficult. I know that you you had a relationship or an affair with a, a married A and R man. You know, yeah. I, I, <laughs> but you're very young, and these are impressionable people around you. Yeah. And so, were you able to have any normal relationships in, up until your marriage, if that would be considered normal? <laughs> Yes, in fact, in in the love respect, I'm very square. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a stayer. I believe in monogamy, even though I was with a married guy. He was only with me. Uh, my first boyfriend from 14 to 16 and a half, 17, I'm still in contact with. That's which great. Is amazing yes um I, then i fell in love with the married man which i think every one of us has one of those things we shouldn't do that was mine uh, mm -hmm. but i but he was my first real sort of oh my god i can't control this that we all have that and yeah. when that and when that hits you in the head you you can't help but go there you learn your lessons and the next guy the big guy was lenny i married him we had our two children and then i've been with my current husband for 28 years now so i'm kind of square i'm not promiscuous and if i'm with you i'm with you and if mm -hmm. i'm not i'm not and i do what i like but if i'm with you i'm with you yeah and and what a great quality and maybe a rare quality in the music business and uh just in life in general so we're talking about the, the appeal that people had to you i'm jumping ahead a little bit one of the things was I think people said if she's cool enough to be friends with Richie and Fonzie, mm -hmm. this has got to be a pretty cool uh, uh, chick, <laughs> if you don't mind me saying. Uh, uh, I don't want to be non-politically correct these days, but uh, Happy Days comes along, and this is how I first discover you um, in reruns, uh, syndication of the Happy Days show. There's so many stories, and for those who don't know this either, you know, Fonzie was dating... Pinky Tuscadero, the actress Ross Kelly on the show, on the show, and her younger sister is Leather Tuscadero, who comes to town. And what a cool image! Joni wants to run away and and, and be a backup singer, <laughs> and this becomes not just a one shot, but becomes a recurring thing. And I think the entire world was, you know, uh, doing your move for for quite some time, and still are. And so I've heard a lot of stories about how Happy Days came about. Some people say that Gary Marshall had a daughter with your, your picture on the wall. Some people said it was a production person. Tell us the truth, how Happy Days came into your life. Okay, I will do. Um, we were on tour in Japan when I got the call from my ex-publicity agent, Toby Mamis, in L.A. Mm -hmm. And he said, there's this cool show, and they'd like you to come over and audition for it. Um, I, and I've never acted before, but I knew I could. I always know I could. Uh, in fact, that's my second love. 
And I said, okay. And he said, I said, I don't know the show. He said, believe me, cool show. Um, so I flew over, went to the hotel, went into the Paramount Studios. I met the producer, Gary Marshall. I met Jerry Paris, the director. I met Fonz, met everybody, did a little reading, da 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 um, it's so strange, all this, how it happened. The, it was Gary Marshall's sister, Ronnie Hallen, who was in charge of casting. And they had this, she told me later on, they had this script for about six months because they knew they were having contractual problems were coming with uh, the girl that played um, Pinky. And they, they didn't think she was going to resign. So they liked the Tuscadero thing, and they developed another character, which was the little sister, which I became. And uh, her daughter, she kept looking. Apparently, they couldn't find this character, which is so funny. They needed to be this person to play this part. It needed to be tough and vulnerable, mm. cute, cute, but sexy, could sing and could act. Hi. <laughs> so she went into her daughter's bedroom and her daughter had a collage of uh, Rolling Stone covers. And in 1975, I was on one of the covers and she, and apparently she looked at that and she went, who's that? That's who we want. And her daughter said, that's Susie Quattro. And then they got a hold of me. So it's so strange how it all happens, isn't it? And I, I am very good friends still with Ronnie and um, Henry. They've been, uh, they've contributed to my book and quotes and I email with Ronnie. We do political emails. You don't want to know. But I one time had a long talk with Ron. We were talking and I said, this was not that long ago. I said, for my own curiosity's sake, when I first came on the show, did I ever seem like I was a new actress new in the show? And he said, no. And that's the strange thing about it. You just came in. He said you were, it seems like you were always there. Strange that. I don't know how that happened. Because Ronnie says you're natural. You're just natural at what you do. And he said to me, don't ever take acting lessons because it would ruin you. So yeah. <laughs> I, hope that, I hope it was a compliment. <laughs> What what great advice. And you continue to act, which which we'll talk about. But so we're looking at a picture from Happy Days here. Ron Howard not only co-starred, but he was your uh, uh, saxophone player sometimes. Sometimes, sometimes he was yeah. lead oh. guitar player playing his best Chuck Berry riffs. You, and, you, but I tell you what, a little story you don't know. Okay. When I when I was doing uh, Johnny B. Good, which I believe that is. No, no, that's saxophone. When he was playing guitar. And he was so insistent because Ronnie doesn't play any instruments. Okay. And he was so insistent that he looked real that he made my ex, he spent hours with him in the dressing room having him show him how to fake Chuck Berry. And he looks like he's playing. Yeah, he did. <laughs> he does pretty good. Yeah, I mean, his yeah. hands are in a Pretty damn place. good. Pretty yeah. damn good, yeah. yeah. For so, You know, for an actor, his hands are in the right places and he sort of has the feel of what those licks should be. And uh, he did. And it turns out to be very, very funny. Uh, First time I hear Devil Gate Drive is on that TV show. That yeah, song, yeah, yeah. for me, becomes such a big part of uh, my life. And I, I, be, I, I was a punk rock fan. To me, Susie Quattro was as punk rock as it got. Yeah, the, sure. <laughs> the way you play, the way you played bass. Again, before there was a thing called punk rock, the word didn't even exist. Devil Gate Drive is just cool and heavy. I'll tell you a really fast story about that song and its inspiration on me. I was producing a uh, co-producing a Christmas record here in Las Vegas with a band that right. I put together called Sin City Sinners. We were going to do a song, Let It Snow, famous Christmas song, and we were going over ideas. How do we make a new arrangement? And I, and we wanted to have a woman sing it. And I got Tiffany, who was the right. famous pop singer. She sang in the shopping malls. Yeah, yeah, she's great. Yeah, yeah. And I got the keyboard player for a heavy metal band called Winger, and he played the piano. And I told them I want to do Devil Gate Drive, and when we do the Let It Snows. The answer is going to be in the Susie Quattro style. Some people knew what I was talking about. Some people listened and learned. And so Tiffany came in. I said, I want you to do your best Susie Quattro. She said, it's a little high for me. And she, <laughs> and we did this version of Devil Gate Drive. This is so many years later, but that song, oh my God. That song stayed. Yeah. I'll have to send you a copy of it. But that song stayed with me. And again, the punk rock movement and the badass women movement. Yeah. 
was was beginning and on a little show like Happy Days. How how crazy that that happened. And yes, for every Devil Gate Drive, there was also Do the Fonzie, you know. Oh uh, my God, yeah. Yeah, they even had me write, I had to write a song for the show. Uh, when uh, Richie almost dies when he gets in the motorcycle accident, I was asked to compose a song at the piano, which I did. Um, a great experience. I was on there for three seasons. Wonderful. It was a good decision. I'm glad I chose to do it, you know? Yes. I want to ask you, I, I don't think you have regret because you're not the type of person who strikes me as someone who does. You were offered a spinoff. They, they, were, they were, Gary Marshall was ready to do a Leather Tuscadero TV show. You, I believe it's Mickey Most who tells you not to do it, maybe fearful that you would be typecast. Is, you tell me. No, Mickey didn't say anything. Um, there, there was a point where it's such a big show, you know, big, big, number one in America. And I was already Susie Quattro all over the world, you know, yes. having million selling hits. I mean, everywhere, all over the world. Um, and it felt to me like it was getting confused. Was I Leather? Was I Susie Quattro? Well, I'm Susie Quattro. Yeah. Leather is a character. So I had done enough of it to establish myself as an actress. I didn't want to be typecast. It was my own decision. And it turned out being right because I did a lot of acting after that. But um, that was enough. You know, people, people got to know me. People discovered in America only. People right. discovered Susie Quattro through Leather Tuscadero, which is fine. At least you got there in the end, you know? Yes, absolutely. And I think in the long run, it did open a lot of doors. Uh, yes. Do, did you ever have this feeling with America, because you are American, you're Detroit born, but yet, and while there were some songs here in America that were doing well, the you were much bigger in other countries. You, you ultimately you've sold 55 million records over worldwide. And so was there ever a part of you that said, like, what is going on in my own country? Like, how is it that I'm so famous everywhere else? I, I, I just accepted it for what it is because um, I'm a realist. And I whenever I went there to tour, and I started touring with the English band back again in America mm -hmm. in 74. We toured everywhere. Uh, sold a lot of albums. People definitely knew about me. But every time I went in a car and turned on the radio, I heard the Eagles or Linda Ronstead. Right. So I think that I broke everywhere in the world was just a little bit early for America, that that's how I look at that in hindsight. And I think it took ha happy days to actually cement that kind of character in the psyche of America. However, you got, like I said, you got there in there. That was my path. That yeah. was how it worked out there. Like I said, I'm, I'm huge everywhere. But yeah, I didn't have as many hit singles in America. But I think you're right. I don't think America was ready for Susie Quattro. When they weren't. When 1977 comes around, which is towards the end of Happy Days run, then uh, your your run with it, the the punk movement started to sneak in and maybe things. But even you know people know the Runaways now, but it wasn't as a household name. It, they weren't on television every week, and I just think maybe that wasn't ready. Like you said, it was very white music. You know, the Eagles, Linda Ronstadt, and Susie Quattro is ahead of your your time. You do crank out records. And for people who are looking for your old music, I believe there's seven, eight full length studio records that people can get a hold of. You didn't stop making music, but for a little while in the eighties, you were also becoming a mother. You, you had two children. Yeah. I was doing, a, I was doing a few things. Um, I'm, I'm an artiste unashamedly. Um, even the rock and roll is my, my home. Mm -hmm. I do, I do everything that an artiste can do. And I always wanted to try musicals and I did. I did Annie Get Your Gun, big success. Yep. I wrote a musical about Tulula Bankhead called Tulula Who. I played Tulula, fantastic. I branched out into radio. I was on BBC Radio 2 for 15 years. Yes. Um, even nominated for Radio Broadcaster of the Year. I did several different TV series that I acted in many different roles. Um, became an author. I'm now writing my sixth book. I, I don't like to, well, I won't be, I won't be boxed in, but at the base of it all, where I live and breathe is my rock and roll. Yeah. And, uh, and it shows, you know, and we should point out about the books. They're not just autobiographies. They're, uh, you're writing novels now, uh, as well. We have links in the description to, so people can either catch up or get familiar because there's so much stuff. I know you've said um, 
life has been good for you. You don't have to survive just on making music, which is a, yeah. a blessing. And, uh, and so it's there and you make it because you love it. One of the stories I find that's so amazing is, and we're going to talk about your brand new record, The Devil in Me, your son, we, we all owe your son a lot of gratitude because he yeah. sort of pushed Susie out to make some new music. He was a guitar player. He wanted to make a record. His mother is, a, is an icon. And he just said, tells you that he needs to write with you. First, I want to know, do your kids realize how legendary you are to everyone else? Yes, I don't. I'm not Susie Quattro to them, but they do know what I do for a living. Absolutely. In fact, real quickly, my mm -hmm. daughter was about six and I was at the house and a photographer arrived. And I said to my daughter, uh, wait in the kitchen with him. I'll be coming right down in a minute. And I told him to get ready for the shot. And I came down in my leathers and my daughter said, Mom, are you going to be Susie Quattro now? I said, yes. Wow. <laughs> you like but, Superman. Yeah. 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 We, yeah. I don't have a phone box um, with uh, with uh, with my son. And I'll tell it briefly because it's 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 just such a wonderful story. He's been in bands his whole life and he wanted to write with me maybe five years ago now. And he showed me a couple of things. And I said to him, you're not quite there yet. And I just didn't feel it. Then he came to me in 2019 early and he said, Mom, I need to write with you now. And I went, oh, that means he's ready. So that became no control. Big surprise. I didn't know it was going to be that fantastic. Mm -hmm. And then they took up the option. for That was big critical success. They took up the option, the record company. Um, he was going to be on the road with the band he works with. I was on the road, locked down. And I said, okay, let's not get depressed. We have an option for the second album. Let's write it. And Richard got his confidence and he... It's such a strange thing to talk about. He um, he was able to, well, let's put it this way. He's watched me on stage since as far back as his memory goes. So mm -hmm. that's in my boy's DNA. Oh, that's that's Susie Quattro. That's mom, but that's Susie Quattro. And he can't get rid of that. So when we made this album, he said, you have to trust me. I know exactly what this album should be. And I want it to be as groundbreaking as your first album. That was our benchmark. And whoa and he made me he, he made me see myself it's so strange i saw myself completely fresh through his eyes and that's what you're hearing on this album yes this is, and it's, it, it's, and it's yeah, fresh it, yeah yeah it, it, this it, is it's, not it's, a a revisit to your past necessarily this is a fresh oh my album. god no uh, this is what i mean and he that's what he wanted to accomplish he always says to me, I, I, he kept saying to me all during the album, trust me, I know what you should be doing. I know what this is. And in the end, I started trusting him totally. Not that mm -hmm. we didn't have a few skirmishes. Sure, we did. Every every artistic thing has that. But, um, geez, he's good. And, you know, he does know who I am. I gave birth to him. He gave rebirth to me. Put it that way. <laughs> yes, what, I've heard you say that. And what a great way to say it. His father also is... Your, your former lead guitar player. So it it is in the it is in the the DNA. Um, I couldn't recommend this record more to people. The link is in the description, so people should uh, check this out. And it, because it, it's what I call a lost release because of the pandemic, um, yeah. doesn't get the proper push that it. But it, it did chart everywhere. And it did chart everywhere. And yes. the good thing is, um, we made four videos so that's mm -hmm. very you're on the media you can get everything there are four videos released from that album so brilliant but just before we leave that um i was sitting in the studio and my ex kept coming down you know kept coming down this is when we were making no control the one that preceded right. this and um i started to feel a little bit awkward that richard was playing everything and my ex wasn't so I, at, at one point, because he just loved to be there, he was enjoying it so much, you know, and um, I turned to him and I said, uh, would you like to play something? And he took a real pause, maybe two or three minutes, and he went, no, I want my son to play everything. I went, ooh. Wow. It's quite teary, actually. I, it was like handing over the baton, you know. Yeah. Well, how, yeah. but how great that you, that one, you guys can still have a, a civil relationship. He is in your documentary. 
and uh, and then have that sort of moment. And like you said, that passing of the torch um, uh, to, to making great music. One of your other projects that I'm a fan of is QSP. And I got to tell you, this is the coolest thing ever. Uh, uh, first of all, I got to say this plea for everybody. America needs Susie Quattro. You, you, you have not performed in America. Uh, I know. And I, I know, <laughs> and I know you were about to. You were on the way. And then this world has yeah. changed. Uh, yes, I, as you know. Yeah, through nobody's fault. It just happened. Yeah, and like I said, you do live in the United Kingdom. And so, um, so but we need you. And when I heard this band, Andy Scott, that's the S, he is the uh, last surviving member of the suite. He is. Anyone who doesn't know the suite, get familiar because it, it's incredible and it inspired so many of your hard rock bands and things that people love. And Andy Scott is all that is left. He's great. He's a guitar player. And then on drums, even crazier, the original drummer for Slade, Don Powell. These are people that America, I don't know when the last time they've seen these, these people yeah. and yourself. And what an incredible project that, uh, and there is records and we're going to link that too, but we, we need, uh, we need at the very least Susie Quattro back in America. We're hoping that things will open soon and that you can get back out and celebrate the anniversaries of this amazing recordings and, and career that you had. I would love it. I would love it. And in fact, we're in talks now, Andy, Don and I, we would like to do another album. Um, we, QSP, Quattro Scott and Pals, supported mm -hmm. Susie Quattro on my 2017 36th Australian tour. And it was hilarious. Only I can do this. I went out with QS and QSP as the bass player singer, mm -hmm. went backstage, changed into my leather jumpsuit and came out of Susie Quattro. <laughs> you, you played in front of yourself. You guys went on and then behind you was the rest of the, the, the Susie Quattro <laughs> show. It's crazy. I sang 30 songs a night, every night, and I never had any problems. That's, a, that's an amazing thing after these years. That's so great. Uh, and you, you, uh, Susie Quattro's sound is not an easy sound. Uh, you, you're probably thinking later, man, I sang some high songs. Oh, I always did. <laughs> you know, my, my learning was um, from age 14, 15, 16, when I started to play the clubs, I sang 99.9% .9 of the songs. They were all, I, I never did anything gentle and mm -hmm. um, five sets a night. That was normal. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it, it, pretty amazing that, uh, you know, nowadays that would be unheard of. I want to make sure we let everybody know. This is, uh, this is Susie Q. This is your documentary. It is really easy to get with streaming technology. It's available on all, all, all the platforms. Um, I watched it. I really enjoyed it. Um, you really do get an insight on a career that if you don't know, you'll be amazed. If you do know, there's things you did you might not have known. And just what a, what, what a story. I'm so happy to see you get your due. As I said, it, it's nothing cooler to me than seeing people in their teens and their 20s who play the bass and, and sing and want to be like Susie Quattro because uh, <laughs> what a... What a great, what what a great influence, um, and and what a great legacy that you've left on people. I know that you said the image wasn't what mattered to you, but even the image. What a what a uh, you know Joan Jett wore cat suits later. Everybody, it's fine. It's great that they did that. But yeah. wow, look, 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 just looking at this picture, uh, the, the, something as innocent as this began, such an amazing career. W was it hard for you to make this movie? Was it hard? It wasn't hard until I saw it. Mm. And I, I had told the director when he said he wanted to do it, I said to him, um, it was so funny because he called me and he said, I'd like to do a documentary on you, da 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 da. He started talking a little bit. Uh, he said, I gotta tell you right away, I'm not a fan. And I went, oh, I said, okay. <laughs> I know it's funny. He said, um, don't get me wrong. He said, I like your music, I'm not a, fan. I went, okay, not a problem. Not a problem at all, actually. I said, then why do you want to do the documentary? And he said, because I saw you on a television show talking and you fascinated me. And I thought, yeah, this is the guy. 
This is the guy. He will fight for what he wants. He won't be kissing my ass. He's going to have his own opinion. And I said to him, okay, ground rules. And I stuck to it. Ground rules are such. I have editing scissors because it's my life. And I won't use them as long as what was said was true. And it's important to the story. And there are many cringe moments in the documentary that I did not take out. And when I watched it with an audience for the first time, I snuck in. I was supposed to be coming up at the end on the Q&A, and I snuck in to see it and feel it with the audience because yeah. that's really the only way you can really see your documentary is with an audience, you know? And um, I was in tears. The entire movie, I was in tears. Uh, all these women coming up and talking, and it just, wow. And I called my friend the next day. Cherie has become a good friend, the ex-lead singer of The Runaways. Yeah, Cherie sure Cherie. And I called her and I, I told her, I said, I was at my premiere last night. She said, yeah. And I said, I just realized something. She said, what? What? And I said, well, I said, by me doing what I did, I gave women permission all over the world to be different. And there was a long pause and she went, and you just got that? <laughs> No, it's great. My, it's one of my favorite stories. But what I like about that is that you see by that story, even I don't have an agenda. I never have. Yes. And, and, you know, we touched on it earlier. Susie Quattro was not vulnerable uh, in the sense of uh, she was tough. And so maybe you had a sweet side too, but for women who were, <clears throat> we're in a generation where uh, there's a lot of mansplaining, as they say. And uh, because you're a woman, maybe you can't do things as well as a man. And that's all bullshit. And this movie shows a career yeah, sure. that you yeah. went on your own, that you've continued on your own. The Susie Quattro brand is now as big as ever worldwide. And it shows. And I think it is an inspiration to people. And I think that um, especially young women uh, who watch this movie will say, you know what? You had to overcome something. There had to be a first, and uh, <laughs> and uh, and and you proved that. I want to ask real briefly, though. You were working on a documentary at one point with Vicky Blue from um, the Runaways. It was going to be called Naked Under Leather. What what happened? Okay, without giving too much away about that, because I won't name names. But what I can tell you what happened without naming names. Yes, there were there were certain people involved who willingly gave their interviews. Um, willingly, cameras are on, they're being asked questions, they're answering the questions. And then when uh, they were shown the clips and shown back their interviews and asked to sign the release, they didn't sign. So mm. basically, basically, they took a lot out of her documentary. We're still very good friends, but um, it just happened that way, unfortunately. It did. Yes, I you can. Know? And yeah, and, and you know, my, my comment on all that is, is, uh, Let's put it this way. If somebody asked me to do a documentary about somebody and I agreed to do it, I would stand by every word I said. Yeah, I, I, I would. Yeah, absolutely. I was curious about it because I remember that was the first time I thought the world is going to get this reintroduction yeah. and for some, a new introduction to Susie Quattro. And so I always wonder, and I thought another woman musician who happened to be a bass player, uh, yeah, yeah. obviously influenced by you, uh, would, would tell that. Um, but I saw so that's why I wanted to know, but it is great. So we got to make sure people go. There's so much to look at. Like you said, five books going on six novel autobiography. Uh, you also have unzip. That's your autobiography. And then, uh, the devil and me also, um, your back catalog, which is readily available. There's so much to see. You can watch happy days too. I mean, you know, it's, it's never too late to discover, um, uh, something cool. I got the fawns right here. We need to have Susie Quattro uh, marketing to go with the fawns. I have a I have a dolly somebody made. It's up in my ego room. It's up there, big Susie Quattro doll. Hilarious. Yeah. I, I think <laughs> that your your image and the uh, the contributions you made to music will live forever. People might say I'm kissing your ass, but you only get so many chances to talk to somebody <laughs> who has had your influence, and it's a great thing to tell them that you appreciate them. And that you're uh, that you thank them for what you've done for music, and for people. And thank you. Thank you so much, Susie. I really appreciate it, and uh, I, I look forward to hopefully seeing you in the states. Yes. Okay. okay. Yo. Oh. All right. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Okay. Bye. -bye.